Welcome to Philadelphia Young Playwrights 2020 Mouthful Digital Monologue Festival. My name is Lisa Nelson Haynes and I'm Executive Director of Philadelphia Young Playwrights. You are about to see five out of eight winning monologues from submissions received from, from students from 12 area schools. These powerful pieces will make you laugh, they'll make you cry, and most importantly, they'll make you think and some may hit close to your heart. At times you will hear mature language and mature themes. For this reason, we recommend viewing ages 14 and up for this performance. For the past two weeks, our student playwrights have worked hard on revisions throughout rehearsal process led by professional directors and collaborators and in collaboration with professional dramaturgs and actors. We want to thank everyone who has made this production of the Mouthful Monologue Festival possible, including our directors, Bijan No and Bashira Williams and Brittany Brewer. And of course, special thanks to our playwrights for sharing their voices and their imaginations. These performances are presented free of charge. However, we are proud to announce that half of all donations made today will go to the Philadelphia Community Bail Fund at Philly Bail Fund to support the Black Lives Matter movement. You can easily give using the donation link you see here on Instagram or by visiting our website at phillyyoungplaywrights.org and clicking donate now. We are starting this afternoon by celebrating one of our honorable mentions, Sarah Sklar, who is a seventh grader at AIM Academy. Her piece, Below My Rope, will be read by Camille Young. You know what? I've had enough of this. You can't always feel bad for yourself. There is more to life than being popular. Stop shutting everyone out. If you want people to like you, then you need to let them in. I get that your life isn't perfect, but whose is? No one's. We all have problems, so get over yourself. And I don't wanna hear all about how nobody likes you because I have been your friend since preschool. It hurts me that after nine years of caring about you and supporting you, that you still just wanna be in the cool friend group. I'm sorry to tell you, to yell at you like this, but you really never listen unless I yell. I try so hard to be nice to you, and in the past few years, it doesn't seem like you are trying to be nice to me at all. I was watching when Jessica invited you to the party this morning. You know how much I wanted to go to that party. That is why we decided to go to the movies. I thought you would be nice enough to at least think about me before saying yes. I was distracted and did not see the banana peel on the ground and I fell in my sloppy joe and got covered in it. You laughed right along with the other kids. When I was waiting in the bus line, I tried not to watch you and all the popular girls get into Jessica's super nice car. I bet there were heated seats and a super cool music. While I was about to get on a cramped bus full of obnoxious teenage boys alone with nobody to talk to. And now, here you are crying at my front door because you got sick and had to leave the party. How much more insensitive can you be? I am not at the end of my rope. I am below my rope. Come in and get something to eat, get changed, sleep here. And starting tomorrow, I will be mad at you for as long as I want.
Sarah, thank you for that amazing piece about the challenges and support that come from friendship. Next, we celebrate festival winner Amanda Lee, who is a junior at Central High School. Her piece, a YouTube reality, will be performed by Frank Jimenez. Hey, uh, hey, Brian. Uh, hey, can can I come in? Uh, we uh, we need to talk. Uh, look, yeah, I, I don't know if you uh, if you know this or, or not, but um, you're you're miserable. And, you know, a lot of people don't see it, and and I'm talking about your your fans, you know, family and, and friends, but. Um, yeah, YouTube is, is taking a toll on you. And, you know, you're putting on a, a fake smile for, for the camera. <clears throat> Look, I, I know you've been on YouTube for like eight years now. <sighs> God, since, since you were 13. But you, you started YouTube for fun. You know, remember? Just doing dumb shit and, <laughs> and not and not stressing over if monetization was was on or not. I, you were happy. You know, but now the, yeah, the fame has gotten into you. You've been acting like the same 13-year-old kid online for years, since the day you started. And now you're, you're 21. Like it, your real life self has matured, but you know, your online self hasn't. Like I know, I know you, I know you don't want to change, okay? Because you, you, know, you think your fans will stop watching you for not giving them the content that they've loved for years. But think about it. Look, your viewers are young, okay, sure, but. Oh, no, don't you think they will grow up? They'll mature and get tired of your childish bullshit, okay? Your planned pranks and, and dumb, crazy skits. They're, they're going to stop watching you. Look, Brian, I... You for years, you know, since the day we met back at that playground and back home in Jersey. I know who you are, okay, what, what you do, what you like. God, you're for the past 15 years. I'm I'm your best friend for Christ. You sit in front of your computer almost every day now. You barely leave the house, and if you do, it is only to film. You're young, Brian. You're 21 fucking years old for God's sake. God, go, go to the club, you know. Go go enjoy the LA life. God, you're you're a mess, Brian. You're sleep deprived. Your eyes are, are baggy. And you stay in your room to edit and all you talk about is planning your, your next video. You know, the money, the views, that's all that matters now, does it not? God, we barely hang out anymore. And I'm literally your roommate living in, in, your, in your fancy apartment, man. I know, I know you, you, are, you feel like you're, you're stuck, you know, like this YouTube career is now a job and you're, you're forced to blow it almost every day, but you know, people with real jobs, they get breaks too, you know, they, they go, they take weeks off to go on vacation, to go to the Bahamas, you know, <laughs> to, to relax. 
spend time with with your families. You haven't even visited your family in years. Your grandmother's your grandmother's getting sick. Did you know that? Look, I'm sorry. Okay, you know I am. I love you. As a brother and as a friend. And you know that I will never try to hurt you or bring you down. But you gotta take a break, man. Look at you. I look in the mirror, dude. No, I'm you know, and I'm not I'm not saying you you should quit YouTube. Okay, you don't you don't have to quit it. Okay, if, if anything, man, you you're the man that deserved to blow up on the media. You know, you don't have to keep up with the act. Living as is a fraud for the rest of your life. the mask away, bro. It's not worth living like this. Amanda's monologue is a beautiful ode to the challenges we face with technology today and the complexity of making our identity both on and offline. Next, we celebrate festival winner, Isabel Ray, who is a freshman at Abington Friends School. Her piece, Running Water, will be performed by Camille Young. How the hell did I get here? That is the only question that my mind can seem to land on at the moment. There's so much anxiety building up inside me that you would think I'm about to go off to war or something. About to engage in battle with an army that is 10 times bigger than my own. But I'm just a girl in a stranger's room, a room that is eerily ordinary, actually. The white sheets that I'm sitting on are sprawled across the bed, leaving a corner of his mattress bare. The walls are an aged gray with no decorations on them, aside from a poster of the Smiths that sits above his desk. The hardwood is creaky and stained with all sorts of shit. He doesn't even have a rug. I have been staring around this room for about five minutes now, attempting to memorize details that aren't even there just to distract myself from my impending doom. Oh. I can't even look out the window because he pulled the blinds down over it. And I can't look down the hallway because he closed the door behind him when he left. I'm trapped in my jail cell that I willingly stepped into. How ironic. My conscience is telling me to just run, to just get the hell out of here while he's still taking that shower. Sure, he'd be disappointed, but it's not like we'd ever see each other again. Plus, then he'd have a funny story to tell his friends about the psycho bitch that ran off just as they were about to do it. There are 
no downsides, that I can see to just getting up and leaving right now. But then again, I can't leave. I'm frozen. Maybe with guilt, maybe with fear or some concoction of both. I am far too drunk and far too upset to tell. <laughs> Doesn't help that I'm heartbroken. I'm sure that you already know the story without me even having to say anything. I got dumped by a guy who I really, really liked. Maybe he was too good for me, or maybe we weren't right for each other. I don't know. It is all too recent and all too painful for me to meaningly reflect on the relationship without bursting into tears. And um, when he left, I was crushed. I am crushed. So I did what anyone who never learned to cope with their emotions in a healthy way would do. I <laughs> went out to go get wasted. I walked into my local Irish pub that reeks of buffalo wings and marital issues <laughs> and sat myself down at the bar. My game plan was to knock out as many Long Island iced teas as I could until I forgot my issues while watching reruns of Cheers that were playing behind the bar with no volume on. That all went to shit once he sat down next to me and this guy was not, is not anything special. He's decently attractive with a C plus personality, if I'm being generous. He brought me some fruity cocktail and started to go on and on about movies that 99% of the world has seen as if they were so very underground. The Godfather? Brilliant. I know. Me and, and all the girls that you've tried that line on tonight have seen it. Oh, and when we kissed, his cologne was suffocating. I just knew what he had come to that bar to do. And <laughs> right on cue, he asked me if I wanted to go get out of there. I am not normally one for hookups or anything like that. I've always been the type of girl to take things slow, to really want to get to know and like a person before I am that vulnerable with them. And if I was in the right mindset, I would have never said yes, but I was sad and drunk and heartbroken and he was right there. What could I do except say yes? So he took me to his apartment, <laughs> led me to his bedroom, and went to go take a quick shower. And now here I am, waiting for him to come back and sweep me off my feet. Maybe if he hadn't left me here alone with my thoughts for so long, I wouldn't be so anxious, but I am, and I can't stop shaking. <sighs> I don't want this. I don't even think I wanted it in the moment. It just felt so nice that he wanted me, that it made me feel like I wasn't unlovable, that sure, the man that I love doesn't want me, but someone does. And someone 
wanted me like he wanted me in the beginning and someone was running toward me instead of away from me. Of course, I know that's not what that meant, that this guy just wants to have fun and there's nothing wrong with that. It just isn't what I want. It isn't. I just want to, I just want to, <laughs> Shit, there is a pit placed firmly in my stomach full of fear and guilt and regret. Yes, I willingly said yes to a nice guy knowing exactly what would happen when we got back to his apartment. So why am I now so apprehensive about all of this? Why am I now so disgusted with the mere thought of touching? Touching. Jesus Christ, I forgot his name. I feel terrible. This guy just wanted to have fun, a non-committal thing, and I just can't. All I want is to mean something to somebody, but I can't mean much to someone whose name I can't even think of. Can I? And sure, I would like to be held, but not by him, by the person that doesn't want to hold me. It's a sick cycle, isn't it? And maybe, maybe he was just searching for something too. Maybe we are two broken people just trying to fill in the cracks with a stranger's company. Or maybe he does just want to smash, but I don't know. What I do know is that it isn't fair for me to be here. It isn't fair to him to treat him like a distraction to my heartbreak. It's not fair to me either. <laughs> and if in the future I want to loosen up and have a rebound for fun, hell yeah, that sounds like a blast but I can't pretend that this is something that it's not that it's gonna fix me and whatever I have going on plus in the future I would never choose to get it on with a guy who likes Morrissey I mean come on I have some standards <laughs> and sure it sucks to leave without saying anything, but I can't feel guilty for coming to my senses, for not going through with something that I was gonna regret for God knows how long. So, to avoid an awkward conversation, I better hurry up and leave while the water is still running. <laughs> Ray, thank you for bringing this topic and this, ver this vulnerable moment of choice in relationships to the stage. A reminder that today's performances are presented free of charge, but 50% of all donations made today via the link here on Instagram or on, your, on our website will go to Philadelphia Community Bail Fund at Philly bail fund to support the Black Lives Matter mo movement. Next, we celebrate festival winner Mokiera Gikonje, who is an eighth grader at Colonial Middle School. Her piece, Mutiny, will be performed by Jenna Kersey. I'm not the first 
of my kind. But I think I came as a surprise. <laughs> After all, I did dominate the world in three months. <laughs> I don't know what you think of me. But I don't care. <laughs> All I do is what I was meant to do. I'm strong. And some hosts are weak. The Legion wins in the end. Usually. In this case, the host I'm occupying currently is steadily getting weaker. So the groups of hostile white discs that normally flow in to fight were becoming fewer by the day. Ugh, but it took very long to beat the host down because these humans unyielding hosts. <laughs> I remember when I thrived in bats. Life was much easier and would have remained that way if the humans had just kept their hands off the bats. It's their fault now that I struggle fighting strong defenses every day. But I'm powerful. And I don't back down. Which is why I'm so successful. <laughs> However, I won't say I was prepared for you, claiming yourselves to be antibodies. <laughs> no, the first time we met, you were terrifying. When you challenged me, I was mm, unprepared. I knew I had to fight, but, but I'd been caught off guard. By the time I'd readied myself, I was surrounded. You engulfed my group in a host's heartbeat. But I showed you, didn't I? I reproduced my army extremely quickly. I guess that's why the humans can't shake me. I could take you the first few times you attacked, but it was getting exhausting. My anger at the humans for taking those bats was the only fuel keeping me going. But I'm ready to give this host up. What's the point in struggling for one in one million? It's becoming frustrating. You never tire. But today, I will win once and for all. I fight blindly, choking and shrinking as your unprecedented powers smother me for the final time. Oh, you spit and call me names, but you're forgetting that I have taken countless hosts. That I cloned myself till I couldn't anymore. I am the biggest army you have seen in years. What's that? I'm a filthy virus. <laughs> well, let's see who's talking after I blow your proteins to bits. <sighs> Even if I fall to your hands in this house, you will never defeat me. If you want to kill me, go for it. I live 
in millions of other hosts. The hosts do their work for me. Sharing me from person to person until nobody is safe anymore. So try as you might, you won't succeed. I'm far ahead of you. <laughs> The va the vaccine. It will kill us all. <laughs> because it heals every host. No. I won't fall after coming this far. If I can rise from a small town in China and take over the whole earth. No vaccine will stop me. I don't care what you say about them. I'll always come back. You wait. Do you think I'm really just gonna end up like the Spanish flu and smallpox taken over by a mere vaccine? Even if it slows my reign for now, I'll be back again. Let the humans believe what they want. They brought this upon themselves by stripping me of the perfect toast. You and the humans would be well not to underestimate me. I am novel coronavirus. I won't be defeated. Right? Wow, thank you, Mokiera, for that juicy and thrilling look into what the thoughts and emotions of the coronavirus could be. Finally, we celebrate festival winner, Lila Unafi, who is an eighth grader at Bala Kinwood Middle School. Her piece, A Great Author's Guide to Success, will be performed by Frank Jimenez. <clears throat> there comes a time, a moment in life, and when you sit back, relax, get a pencil out, and ask, what kind of award-winning novel am I going to cook up today? Or perhaps your parents have just announced that they are giving you two more weeks to come up with some cash before they kick you out of the basement. I try not to judge how and when inspiration strikes. Honey, you're 45. Get a job already. I write freelance, Mom. Always filming, never doubt, never work. Mom, I'm filming. But before you take the plunge into the literary world, a ruthless, competitive, desperation-driven 
universe. It is important for you to achieve a writer's mindset. As you craft your work, you will find that being in the correct state of mind is essential. <laughs> Not only do we step into the shoes of an author when we pick up a pen, but we transform ourselves into a whole new character. Now, to speed up the process, well, <laughs> I recommend this special tip. Find two scraps of paper, scrawl. I write because I have no real talent on the first. And on the second, Scrawl, I write because I need the cash. Carry both of these scraps around with you whenever you leave the house, which, let's face it, doesn't happen often. It'll help you remember who you are. Next, you'll want to cancel anything and everything that miraculously happens to be on your social calendar. <laughs> yeah, you're a writer. You, you don't have time for a, for a social life. But if anyone asks what you do, you reply, I write freelance with as much authority as possible. Uh -huh. Now, this little trick is guaranteed to keep you sharp and single. Unfortunately, being an author isn't as easy as we always like to imagine. No, no, no. In fact, all those who follow in the footsteps of Edgar Allan Poe and J.K. Rowling are doomed to come across an unthinkable oh, writer's block. Mm, knowing how to overcome this mind-numbing disease as is important to your career as knowing how to write. Huh? Okay. Okay, whenever you find yourself in this inevitable situation, I highly encourage you to turn to every author's MVP, Google. Now, thanks to the large database of pre-written novels at your fingertips, you'll have no trouble copying and pasting lines from shady websites into your next great work of art. <laughs> in fact, for example, my debut novel, the Life and Times of Arnold Arthur were actually a collage of inserted lines from a sketchy PDF of the entire Harry Potter series. Are you wondering if Grammarly is doing more writing than you are? Good. You should be. Now that you've prepared for the rough times ahead, I've got a few more useful pointers to help change your writing from boring to downright monotonous. Now, as someone who's spent years mastering his, his craft, you can just, you can trust me, okay? If there's an absolute, no, no, in every literary masterpiece, it's dull characters, okay? Readers will subconsciously form bonds with their fictional friends. And when your characters are well, particularly uh, uh, attractive, well, the chances of your reader being hooked to the story skyrockets. Now, the key to creating appealing personas in your work of art is to make every character you write about exceedingly sexy. <laughs> Refer to this overwhelming sexiness in everything they say and do. <clears throat> Frank the carpenter took a cup of coffee out of the refrigerator. He sipped it. <sighs> hmm? See, not to the untrained eye, okay, this passage may seem ordinary and irrelevant, but to just do a little, it can be much, much more. Frank, the extremely sexy carpenter, 
took a cup of coffee out of the refrigerator with his tanned, muscular arms. <laughs> he sipped it. Eh? Eh? You see what I mean? Okay, just simply changing in which the way you portray Frank will make a world of a difference to the eyes of your audience. But readers are hard to please, okay? And it takes more than just attractive characters to keep your readers hanging onto the edge of their seat. Let me introduce you to a writer's best friend. Plot twists. A good plot twist is sudden, jaw-dropping, that makes you think, I never saw that coming. It turned out that Frank was actually a serial killer. <laughs> and nobody knew but his sexy wife, Sally. And I shock you, <laughs> am I right with <laughs> you? Who in the right mind would suspect Frank, a friendly and sexually attractive carpenter of murder? <laughs> Sally, oh, what shall I do? Alas, I have been arrested for these countless crimes I have committed. <laughs> Will I ever see you again? Or is our love cursed forever? Now, the, the great thing about, about plot twists oh, gee, is that they, uh, they never get old. Mm -hmm. okay, you can just use them as many times as you want. You know, just layer them in there. <laughs> One right on top of the other. <laughs> Trust me. Okay, your readers love the suspense. <laughs> Frank was also a werewolf. <laughs> and his great shape-shifting abilities, he broke out of prison and ran back to his <laughs> home. <laughs> and then he discovered that Sally had disappeared. Why, Sally? Why? Now, by enveloping your tail in a giant cloud of mystery, your reader is stuck second guessing more every move. Okay, how do we know okay, that Frank is actually a carpenter? Okay, and how can we trust Sally? How much do we trust her? Meaning, like, and when did this book shift into erotica? Now, the triggering questions such as these. Well, you're setting yourself up flawlessly for the grand reveal. <laughs> And when that moment comes, you better squeeze out every ounce of creative energy that you've got. Suddenly, Frank dropped to the floor dead. The coffee that Frank had been drinking wasn't coffee at all. It was poison. And rumbled in the distance, and Sally laughed maniacally <laughs> because she had planned the whole thing. Oh. The end. Nor is it. Huh? Frank, come get your dinner. It's ready. Mom, I said it's cut the trust off. It's pizza. That was Lila's monologue. Lila, that was brilliant satire and poke fun at what, ha what it means to be a good writer at the, in the funniest of ways. If you missed any of today's performances or would like to revisit a piece that resonated with you, videos will be available on our social media channels and website shortly. Or listen to more student monologues on our podcast, Mouthful, available on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcast. If you're interested in writing a monologue of your own, we encourage you to visit the PYP at Home tab on our website for resources, or we invite you to sign up for our summer monologue intensive 
will be held over Zoom the week of July 27th. We so appreciate it if you can make a donation to support Philadelphia Young Playwrights and future performances just like this one. A reminder, 50% of all donations made today via the link here on Instagram or on our website will go to the Philadelphia Community Bail Fund at Philly Bail Fund to support the Black Lives Matter movement. Thanks for everyone joining us on this beautiful day and for supporting our young people and community.